Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. We're so excited today to have Dr. Sharon Blackie with us. Uh, Sharon is an award-winning writer, psychologist, and mythologist. Her highly acclaimed books, courses, lectures, and workshops are focused on the development of the mythic imagination and on the relevance of myths, fairy tales, and folk traditions to the personal, cultural, and environmental problems we face today, as well as writing five books of fiction and nonfiction, including the best-selling If Women Rose Rooted and her latest Hagitude. Her writing has appeared in anthologies, collections, and in several international media outlets, among them The Guardian, The Irish Times, and The Scotsman. Her books have been translated to several languages, and she has been interviewed by the BBC, U.S. Public Radio, and other broadcasters on her areas of expertise. Her awards include the Roger Deakin Award and a Creative Scotland Writers Award. Her next book, Wise Women, Myths and Folklore in the Celebration of Older Women will be published by Virago in 2024. Sharon is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts and has taught and lectured at several academic institutions, Jungian organizations, including the Philadelphia Association of Jungian Analysts, uh, retreat centers, and cultural festivals around the world. So Sharon, welcome. Um, I enjoyed so much a uh, chance to get to know you several years ago when you came to Philadelphia back when we did those things more. But it's nice to be with you again virtually this morning. And uh, I'm wondering if we could start off, we're going to be talking today about um, Sharon's fabulous most recent book, Hagitude. And would it be possible to ask you to begin today by just reading a portion right from the beginning? Indeed, I'll read you a, a couple of paragraphs and just to say it's an absolute delight to be with you and thank you so much for the invitation and the chance to, to have a conversation about this work. So, Hagitude. How the journey begins. In the oldest known cosmology of my native lands, it wasn't a sky-bound old man with a beard who made and shaped this world. It was an old woman. A giant old woman who has been with us down all the long ages since the beginning of time. When I was a young lass, the ocean was a forest full of trees, she says in some of the stories about her, stories that are still told today, firmly embedded in the oral tradition. This mythology is from right here, from these islands of Britain and Ireland, strung out along the farthest western reaches of Europe where I was born and where I still live today in the lands where my feet are firmly planted. Although a lot of attention has been paid to the question of whether ancient European cultures honoured a great mother goddess, in these islands we were actually honouring a great grandmother. Her name in the Gaelic languages of Scotland and Ireland is the Caliach, literally the old woman. There are traces of other divine old women scattered throughout the rest of the British Isles and Europe. They're probably the oldest deities of all. How thoroughly we've been taught to forget. Today we don't see these narratives as remnants of ancient belief systems. Rather, they're presented to us as folk tales intended merely to entertain, as oddities of primitive history, the vaguely amusing relics of more superstitious times, or bedtime stories for children. Oh, those are such a stirring beginning and it's so lovely to hear you read it. So thank you. Thank you. Sharon, at what age did you realize that the stories that you had been raised with, fairy tales, folk tales, were pointing to something larger and something deeper that was personally about you? I would say that that would have been probably in my late 30s when I was living in America. 
I lived in America for, for six years and I began, I was on my third midlife crisis at this point. <laughs> and um, I began to realize that that, that was not my place, um, that much as I loved America and had always wanted to retire to Montana in some wonderful log cabin, um, that just I didn't feel rooted there and I didn't feel like the stories of the place were mine. And so I began to look back at my own stories and particularly I was looking for stories that told me how to be a woman in today's world and you know clearly there are lots of wonderful Native American stories but they don't belong to me so I started to look back at my own tradition and with the kind of you know slightly greater wisdom of age I began to to understand as I delved very deeply into them I'd always worked with story but not quite so deeply I began to understand that these actually were cosmologies you know, they weren't just odd bits of, of entertainment or odd bits of this and that, that these represented the worldviews of my ancestors and women were really important in it. So I think that's the time where I really began to figure out that there was something big here that was not really being explored. And how did that change your own feeling about yourself? Having these images of a cosmology that's initiated by the great grandmother, by the hand, you know, of yeah. the mother of the universe. How did that encourage you to see yourself and women differently? It changed everything. I had grown up in a very poor um, part of England and my uh, mother was an alcoholic um, during my mm. childhood and teen years. So mm. I had a very negative image of, of women. Uh, I loved my mother dearly. She had many fine qualities, but she was not kind of a role model, you know, for how to be a woman. And I didn't really have any among my friends and family. I just couldn't find a good role model. I had some very feisty old aunts, mm. but, mm. you know, that was a little bit different. And so I, I really grew up uh, in my 20s and 30s without really being very comfortable um, about being a woman. I didn't want to be a man, but I just didn't really know what kind of journey I might take as a woman that wasn't a mm. hero's journey. And like many women of my age, I was taking the hero's journey, even though it's not designed, I don't think, for, um, for a woman's psyche. And so that shifted everything because it gave me insights into ways of being and particularly in relation to creativity you know so many of these women in our native traditions and european traditions are creatrixes they're literally creating the world they're weaving the world into being and also perhaps more particularly in the way that these very powerful women were so profoundly associated with the land and with their places and that really just hit something in me that i hadn't quite grasped before. Mm -hmm. Like the importance of rootedness. Yeah, the importance, yeah, the importance of place, you know, and I've always said that as I look back, place has been my biggest teacher. Not that humans haven't been important, but somehow the places that I've lived, particularly since I came back from America when I was, um, when I was around uh, 40, every place I've lived has taught me something and some way of being that I really needed to learn at the time. You know, there was, a, there was a place that taught me everything I needed to know about age and endurance. There was a place with a laughing little river that told me everything I needed to know about lightening up. <laughs> and mm -hmm. those kind of archetypes of place in our, in, our, in our traditional mythology are very much reflecting the archetypes of the women in the old stories. And yeah, that was really, that was profoundly transformative. Well, I was going to say that I think that um, place or nature or the land is a manifestation of the archetypal feminine. Yeah. So what, what you didn't maybe have with your personal mother, uh, for all her many wonderful qualities, y y you experienced the, the archetypal feminine through place. I, I did, yes. And I also, I think for the first time, began to get to grips with the archetype of mother through place, mm -hmm. because that was yes. an archetype I wanted nothing to do with. When somebody said mother, I just couldn't see what that could be that, you know, that would be good. And mm -hmm. that sense of kind of mother earth, although it sounds a little um, obvious and um, even trite, but that sense of, of a mother earth that was nurturing in a, you know, in a different kind of way in, in that in that sense of, of providing everything without controlling, providing everything mm -hmm. without asking actually for anything very much in return. That sense of just being there, of, of being abundant, 
those were qualities that I wanted to kind of, you know, to express in myself. I mean, I'm, I'm not a mother. I've never had children. But, mm -hmm. but that sense of abundance of being able to give to others in a way that was kind of spontaneous. I didn't know how to do that. I wanted badly to, but I didn't know what it would look like. And I think a mm -hmm. lot of these women, um, even though clearly they're, you know, they're in, they, they, the stories come from 2,000 years ago um, and they reflect in their in original forms the lives of our ancestors which are very different today nevertheless those archetypal qualities as archetypes do um i think remain with us and, and just take different forms perhaps now i think your personal story of archetypal healing is so wonderfully um, held and is a great example of something that jung has promoted that so many people misunderstand and even modern clinicians have in some ways abandoned. And the fact that whether we've had an absent mother or a negative mother complex or an absent father or a negative father complex, that even at the center of our ambivalent feelings about our parents is a core image, a core force that is so much more than our lived experience. And if we can only encounter hints, images, stories that expand the potential of the archetype, we can grow in ways that we couldn't have imagined when we were young. So your story is such a wonderful lived example of how the archetypes can save us. Indeed, and I have always thought that stories are the things that will save us, you know, mm -hmm. regardless of whether our lived experience has been very rich and wonderful or not. Um, I, stories for me as a child were not just a form of escapism. They, they were, fairy tales particularly, were a way of kind of convincing myself that in the face of seemingly impossible circumstances, impossible domestic circumstances that I was living through, that with a bit of imagination and the help of a, a, a band of hungry mice or a wise old woman in the <laughs> woods, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you could always find a way through. And that whole sense of stories having at their heart fairy tales, particularly having at their heart transformation, meant yes. that ever since I understood that as a as actually quite a young child, you know, that these are showing me how to change, how to how to mm -hmm. how to change my story, how to change my place in the world. I, I have always believed that transformation is the most fundamental value uh, that I hold, you know, the necessity for transformation. I mean, not for the sheer hell of it, but transformation right up to the end. Mm. Uh, you don't ever stop growing. You don't ever stop becoming. Which, of course, is a central tenet of Jung. Indeed, yeah, that indeed. Growth. And, you know, strangely, I did I did the classic kind of um, psychology training, I suppose. I, at, at 18, I went off to university and did a psychology degree. And mm. it was uh, the, the psychology department I ended up in was quite behaviorist, um, very scientistic. And um, I think we had, when we were looking at the history of psychology, we had half a lecture on Freud and a sentence on Jung. I still have those mm -hmm. notes, uh, literally yep. a sentence on Jung. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then just, you know, laughter from the lecturer. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and it really was uh, quite considerably later that I actually began to read Jung and, and realize that, that that was what I had been looking for all the time. You know, that mm. sense of, of transformative possibility, that sense of archetypal characters really... It, it, like, like you're having a, a real relationship with them because they are working on you and mm -hmm. interacting with you and changing your life in ways that kind of like, you know, real people would. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that, was, that, was a, that was a very big thing for me and for my work. I want to go back for a second and pick up on something that you mentioned a couple of minutes ago and my ears perked up because you said that you were living the hero's journey. I think it was when you were in your... 30s in the living in the United States, if I got that right? I'd say through all through my 20s and 30s, yeah. Okay. Until okay. late. Until late 30s. And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I'm interested in, in that, if you care to share, but I'm also interested in what you said next, which is you don't think it's really appropriate for women to take the hero's journey. And I've, I'm, I'm curious, how, how do you see a woman's journey as differing from a man's journey? And what, what is... What would the heroine's journey be? Well, uh, if I can come back to that, I do just want to say that, that I've written recently quite a lot about what um, 
I, I call and a couple of other people before me have called it, so I didn't coin the term, the, the post-heroic journey, which I think is equally applicable okay. to men and to women. So I'd love to come back to that if we, if we have a, a moment. But certainly for me, um, in my 20s and 30s, you know, I was taught that you needed to have a, a, a professional, you needed, everything needed to be focused around your career. You know, a good mm. job was everything. I was taught to be outwardly focused um to um to to want more of everything um to work myself into the ground because that was how you succeeded and that was how the culture measured success mm. and um i've always seen the hero's journey as as very linear as profoundly individualistic um whereas what i call the post heroic journey is much more not circular but spiraling Mm -hmm. um, more focused on community than individual glory, um, not so much focused on taking more all the time, but living with what is, what is enough. Um, and so I think for me that the hero's journey and the world in which I lived, the corporate world in which I lived, did not value what we might think of as feminine qualities, you know, the classic mm. feminine qualities of creativity, of nurturing, of intuition, of empathy, which, of course, as we all know, are possible both in men and, and women, but they've, mm -hmm. they've been thought of as, um, as feminine qualities. And, and so to me, but either a, hero's, a heroine's journey or the post-heroic journey um, requires the melding of those qualities with the also very useful qualities of linearity and, and rationality and intellect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. So it's not so much that the hero's arc, hero or heroine's arc, in terms of separating from the family, finding a place in the world, gaining your own skills, getting your own money, that that does have a place in the first half of life. But I think what you're saying for both men and women, being stuck in that, you know, for the last half or last third or last quarter of one's life can deprive everyone of a richness, a soulfulness that they've earned by getting their survival needs lined up, mm -hmm. by giving themselves the opportunity to not have to work 50 hours a week or God knows what else, right. to be able to contemplate, to be able to become poets and writers like yourself. Indeed, and, and again, you know, that was one of the, the things that struck me so much about Jung's work on the second half of life when I was researching Hegetude, that sense that, okay, so the first half of, of, of life, your journey is supposed to be outwardly focused. Maybe, maybe for some, not for everybody, you know, some kind of a hero's journey is, is sensible and is part of, part of our developmental path. Um, I don't think that for many women, actually, the hero's journey is necessarily a good path it, it certainly wasn't for me but I do think that for everybody in the second half of life if we are turning inwards if we are looking to, for, for um, to the transcendent function if we are looking to the numinous if we are looking um, to a search for meaning and, and a spiritual perspective on the world that is not a hero's journey the hero's journey is very outward focused and so we need something that I have been more comfortable calling the post-heroic journey, um, which is all about, as I see it, um, finding our calling, um, you know, going back to, to James Hillman's work, particularly in The Soul's mm -hmm. Code, finding, a, and in fact, going back much further than that to Plato, who first mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wrote about this, um, that sense of identifying what the unique gift is that each of us brings to the world at mm -hmm. this time. That, it, to me, is what the second half of life <coughs> is really about. You know, we've done all of the experimenting when we were younger. We've played a little bit. We've tried this, perhaps, and we've tried that. But now it's like, okay, what is the essence of who I am? What is the essence of who I am as a soul? And how does that essence serve my own personal spiritual journey, but also the world in very troubled times? And one of the things that I really appreciated about your book was that you say that it's after menopause that women really kind of experience this burning away of all this dross that we don't need to find that essence, to find that thing that we came into the world to become. So that really rewrites this stage of life as a, a very different time for women. The caretaking is behind us. The, the maybe perhaps professional striving in some sense might be behind us and we can really sink into 
who were we meant to become? And maybe we can even become that. Indeed. And, uh, you know, in, in Hagatude, I, I do describe menopause as an alchemical process and, and, and uh, consequently as a kind of time between stories. So you have the story of the first half of life and then all of a sudden for women at menopause, that shatters. You know, everything mm -hmm. that you thought defined you is, is slipping away, whether we're talking about youth, beauty, um, you know, other kind of physical functions, health. Wh whatever it might be. Health often, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. is, is slipping away. And yet you have, you have no, the culture doesn't tell us that there is a story at all post-menopause. Mm -hmm. So, but there is this new story waiting to begin. And that period between the two stories, I think is a profoundly transformative time. And I do think of it as, as an alchemical process where, you know, if you look at the negredo, um, particularly, um, and mortification, which is literally, you know, burning back to, to mm -hmm. the bones, that is what is happening to us. I mean, physically, <laughs> as well as psychologically mm -hmm. with hot flushes and, and so on. And, that that is all about finding if if everything that you once thought you cared about or has defined you is slipping away what's left what's left and how can you take what is left to build the new story that's ahead of you because let's face it you know for most women if you look at average life expectancy post menopause there are you know a, a good 3 decades ahead of us if we're lucky mm -hmm. enough to survive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's a lot of life to do something with mm -hmm. yeah it is Sharon, if I could swing back to something which I think, Lisa, you had asked earlier, but I had heard in a comment, that while we all understand something about the heroic journey, that your own self-reflection has left you feeling that the heroic journey paradigm that you had used, perhaps coming on in your 20s, for instance, had not served you, and that you wish you had found a different way of imagining that first half of life. Mm -hmm. Hindsight being twenty twenty, of course, and the wisdom we all have with age. What's the story that you wish you had found when you were in your late teens or early 20s that, mm -hmm. that could have set you on the different path? Yeah, that's a really good question, but I don't think it was for lack of a story. Oh. Um, I think when you grow up in, a, in an environment where, you know, it is very poor, where you have a violent father and where you have an alcoholic mother, then, the one, then, then you don't feel ever safe or secure. In, in your childhood, that that just is something that, that you don't recognize. Mm. And I think for me, the thing that I wanted more than anything um, as, I, as I left home at 18, after which my mother had stopped drinking, my father was long gone, but I, I, want, I, needed, I needed to feel safe and I needed to feel secure. So I took a path that, that was a path of safety and security. You know, mm. um, I went down an academic route, but I couldn't get tenure and it was impossible to buy a house and all of the rest of it. So I went into a corporate environment because I felt that I needed to be safe. Uh, and I stayed in that corporate environment on and off for about, I would say about 15 years. And uh, I tried to leave a couple of times, but then circumstances drove me back. And I think I spent a lot of time beating myself up for that, you know, because I had I had done the classic stepping off the path that leads you to your calling. That wasn't who I was. That wasn't who I was supposed to be. But I didn't know who I I was supposed to be. I didn't know what it would look like if I didn't do this job. What would I do? And it was only, as as I say, after my third midlife crisis mm -hmm. in my late thirties that I finally figured that I, that I was never going to know if I didn't just leave, and then see mm -hmm. see what happened. And at that stage in my life, I thought, okay, you know, I I recognised that the the safety and security had been um, a stumbling block for me, um, and just decided to to go for it, to just leave the job and see what happened. So you know, this is what happened. Yeah. I'm sitting with the field that so many of us have had and, and I share with you having come from a really turbulent home how <laughs> that first quarter or longer of the life is just about getting our feet on the ground finding some ground any ground mm -hmm. that feels wholesome finding any environment that we can exhale in I think it's a worthy task I think in hindsight, it's sad that we had to use up whatever time we needed just to get a good start again. I suppose it does teach us something that we carry later into life about trauma yeah. and about needing to forge a life that we weren't blessed with easily. 
Yeah, certainly, certainly about resilience, of course. Mm -hmm. But what is interesting is, as I've I've grown older and I've I've delved more into that concept of calling, I have actually come to believe that there is no wrong path. Hmm. You know, um, I mean, clearly, I, I think most of us at some point in our lives, unless we're very focused or very lucky take steps off the path that is aligned with our ultimate calling. But what is interesting for me, if I look back at those years spent in a corporate environment, is that I gained so many skills that I am now putting to good use. And, you know, it's not that I wouldn't like not to have spent all of those years in it, but I can't really regret it because it's made me the person that is able to write the books that I write. And I think it's important for all of us who are inclined to beat ourselves up for what we think of as incorrect choices um, that we actually look at, we step back and we look at the big picture and 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 the the nature of the journey. I, I don't believe very much in destinations. I believe very heavily in in journeying on. Um, the right way to wholeness is full yeah. of fateful detours and Absolutely. wrong turnings. Yes. Absolutely. So said Jung. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you were talking about transformation. I love your idea that fairy tales are ultimately about transformation. That that feels right to me. And then you had mentioned uh, going through three midlife crises by the time you were 40. And then in the book, you write really beautifully about the image of the snakeskin and sort of shedding and transforming and changing. And that really comes across strongly in the book that it's about that life, that your life has been about transformation, that life is about transformation. And I, I can certainly relate to that. I mean, I think, you know, one of the lovely things that I've discovered painfully in the past few years is that, you know, even after analytic training and plenty of decades here on earth, I can still really surprise myself, <laughs> you know, that there's, there's more, there's, there's more that I don't know. And that can, well, it can be painful, but it's, it's also somehow really reassuring. And I'm just wondering, I mean, in your opinion, Sharon, do we just keep on transforming right up until the final transformation? Do we do we ever get a rest? Well, is it a rest? Is it a restful? Is it a restful thing not to transform? I don't think I'd find it very restful. I think I'd be fidgety. Um, but um, I, I do. Th I think so. Yes, I think. I mean, I, I think. In, you know, some transformations are incredibly turbulent and are and and uh, bring with them massive life changes I don't think transformation has to be about that and so you know as I see it today so I'm 62 and have just made a major move again after a series of moves back to the north of England where I was born to kind of come to terms with all of that young um, stuff um, and I don't see another big upheaval like that in my future mm. I actively will resist it I don't want it I don't want to change my job anymore you know I'm very happy in the work that I do but but my I expect my transformations to be more internal and transformations of meaning transformations of relationship for mm -hmm. sure I mm -hmm. think we always must you know keep doing that um, and so yeah I, I do expect that I, I think elderhood you know there there is a sense even when women accept or men too uh, accept the idea that in the second half of life is a different journey that okay you get 60 and it's like okay yeah something's changed right that's it now you know I'm going to be like that for the next 20 years come yes. on I mean you know that never happens does it yes. it just doesn't yeah. happen so I think preparing ourselves for transformation and seeing it as a positive in spite of the pain that almost inevitably comes with it is it's just a really good attitude to yeah. approach life with you know, it, you, you raise a good point. I mean, I, I can certainly, I had sort of external world transformations early, you know, changing careers or, you know, becoming a mother or whatever. Um, but, but my recent ones, you know, sort of since menopause have had to do with how I, th how I thought about myself or what I knew, mm -hmm. what I knew about myself, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I sort of like, oh, I thought I knew who I was. Well, you know, I've done lots of analysis and you know it's like no y y you don't know everything yet you know Jung said you can't empty out the unconscious mm. and you're still there, becoming I mean you and, know you might yeah. know who you were but who right. you are now and who you're going to grow into is, is mm -hmm. still an unfolding adventure mm -hmm. isn't it yeah so Sharon let's talk a little bit about the archetype of the hag 
<laughs> that being so central to the current book, and, and you've written about many different things over the years, but the archetype of the hag, the stories of the hag, have become so important. In your book, you mention that they've been important to you as a way of imagining and claiming aspects of your own feminine soul, but also feeling that the hag has a role in the cultural crisis right now, mm -hmm. that she could have a role in the world. So perhaps you can introduce us to the archetype of the hag and perhaps talk about her in one of the tales through which you met her. Yes, so what is interesting about the women who we can think of as hags in European myth and folklore is that they are not ever defined by their relationship to anybody else. They're not ever mm -hmm. defined by anybody else. They're not someone's mother, grandmother, wife, daughter. They might be, but that's by the by. They are in those stories precisely for who they are. They are entirely sufficient unto themselves. They don't need anybody else to tell them who to be or who to become. And that really characterizes them all. And I think, again, as we move into the second half of our lives, women particularly, I think, I know it's also true for men, but women particularly ha have by then already struggled to know who to be in a culture that doesn't value us quite as much still today, in mm -hmm. spite of everything. And it's only going to get worse. And, I, and what I loved about the hags is that they didn't need anyone to say that it's okay to be that. They just were that. You know, whether you liked it or not, whether it was comfortable or not, they played a critical part in the story, and that's what they were for. So you find many challenging and, and wonderful hags. One of the hags that I love very dearly um, is an archetype which I conceive of as being related in many ways to the trickster archetype as a, as a profound disruptor mm -hmm. and kind of a subset of the trickster archetype is the truth teller. And we have a lot of old women in um, European uh, folklore who are truth tellers. So the classic um, example of that would be in the Grail legends, where Parseval, as it usually is, or Galahad, whoever it might be, is you know feeling very pleased with himself, having become a knight, sitting around with the knights of King Arthur's court, all very fine, you know, um, and then out of the woods rides this a r ridiculous looking character called Kundry in um, one of the versions of it, who is the grail messenger. She is, she bears the message of the grail. She mm. rides out of the wood and she tells Parseval all of the ways in which he has been a complete shambles, all of the ways in which he is failing, all of the ways in which he has, you know, no compassion, no heart, no morality. And then she rides back into the woods again and leaves him completely shattered, but shattered in a way that makes him stand up and look around him and look at himself so that he goes on his journey. He spends some time with a hermit. You know, he's not just all about swashbuckling, fighting battles, blah, blah. He is actually looking into himself and mm -hmm. into his heart. And when he eventually... Um, asks the, the grail question, which he omitted to ask first time around and so attains the grail, Kundry is the first one to ride back out of the woods and tell him what a really good job he's done. Yeah. So, But that sense of the truth teller, you know, the woman who just says it's not very popular, it's not what you want to hear, but doesn't do it for the sake of it. You know, she's not telling the truth just because she's had a bad day. Um, she's not just coming out with... Um, with 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 the truth because she feels a need to tell her truth it's not none of that kind of nonsense that we sometimes find today she she mm. is telling the truth when it is necessary when it is required for him to move on for the story to progress and i think that that is a quality of old women that we have lost today we do have a lot of truth telling that is often rage fueled you know mm -hmm. or yes. fueled by other problems that people have but that sense of a kind of righteous truth telling Mm -hmm. a little bit like righteous wrath is so much there in the stories and i like that very very much you have dangerous old women like baba yaga from the slavic traditions you know mm -hmm. who are testing the young people to the point of death this is this is um th this high stakes game with baba yaga if you go looking for fire or for light mm -hmm you have to pass the test. And if you don't, you'll get put in her big man-sized oven and you'll be eaten. You know, the stakes are high. It's not good enough just to try a little bit. You've got to try with everything that you are. So these old women who understand what is required to make someone grow, to make the story move on, to make the, the, the point of the story, the 
ending of the story I hate that word but I can't can't think of a, a better one right now mm-hmm. the best that it can possibly be the fullest the most itself that's the old woman that I really love when you were describing uh, Kundry and her particular role with Parseval I was thinking about uh, the way we conceptualize the dream maker mm-hmm. that that the eye of the dream maker is looking at what we're not doing looking at the way in which we are failing our potential and finds its own symbolic way to communicate that to us over and over and over again, mm-hmm. day after night after night. Um, so sh- so she's wonderfully depicted in that tale as a psychic function of the self. Yes. And that she rides out of n- from nature itself, almost as an extension of neighbor, uh, nature, yeah. offering this compensatory mirror. Mm-hmm. And of course, when that happens at the right time, it's both shattering and liberating. And it frees us of all of the misguided efforts that we thought were so important or, and or were convinced are going to bring us to the pinnacle. Yeah. Right, it punctures our inflation. Yes, you know, indeed. And it's, it, and, and it's a real confrontation with shadow that if we can mm-hmm. have that, it is, uh, it's very painful. But, uh, but then we do ride forward with a different attitude. Yes, yes. I mean that 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 uh, tr- trickster is a mirror, is, isn't it? I mean it is an archetype. It's it's a disruptor, but it's a disruptor that holds a mirror up to the culture or up to the self. Um, it's disruption. Generally speaking, in most of the stories, not for the sake of disruption. It is disruption because something needs to shift. Something has been stagnant. Something is something is dead. Um, and yeah, I think uh, that's a very very powerful archetype. And it's often said that tricksters are mostly male. Do you know they're not actually? If you look at mm. trickster as disruptor rather than trickster as joker, which you know I do mm-hmm. see trickster and joker as actually different archetypes. But trickster as disruptor, there are women all over the place doing trickster stuff. In that context. Yeah, Del McNeely has that wonderful book, Mercury Rising, on the female trickster. Um, oh, so okay. yes, I think that, I that, don't know uh, that one. I recognition. Must, I'll make a note. Yeah, that's right, a, it, it right. makes perfect sense. And just in the context of what you were saying, just um, about dreams and given the function um, of your dream school and so on, there is another wonderful old woman in the Scottish tradition um, from the Isle of Skye who unusually is seen um, with a husband, an old woman, clearly a divine old woman. Normally the Kaliach, who I spoke about when you asked me to read the, the first part of the book, is a very solitary old woman, you know, up in the mountains. In this particular story, she has a husband. And um, to cut a long story short, a little a young girl gets lost in the mountains one day uh, when fog comes down. She's picking blueberries. Um, she is led up the mountain by um, a herd of deer and she comes to a cave inside which there is an old woman and an old man. And they are the dream makers. They make the dreams of the world. So the old man, they sit and look in a a pool and they see, you know, what's happening in the world reflected in the water of the pool. The old woman makes cheese out of the milk of the deer, gives it to the old man who literally makes the cheese into dreams. And then he stands at the face of the cave and um, a black, you know, ravens and crows come and take the dreams um, that are kind of bad dreams or nightmares. And then a dove comes and takes the other dreams and it's all very pretty. But, but this is the only story that I have ever come across about actual dream makers. Isn't it? It's oh, just such a lovely beautiful. idea. That's and and I love that the dreams uh, are born of fermentation. <laughs> yes. Right? Because that is, such, that, that, is so, that is so right on about some of these... Uh, the products that the unconscious gives us mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, indeed. Beautiful. That's really beautiful. <laughs> um, so would you mind telling us the story, that incredible story that you tell in the book about the Kaliach's bed? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, y- you know, when I was living in Scotland and... Um, Spent four years on the Isle of Lewis in the Outer Hebrides. Um, we kind of, my husband and I had kind of run there, to run away there <laughs> to escape civilization, which clearly was going to hell in a handbasket. We didn't really know what to do. We just figured this out, you know, quite late in our lives. And so we thought, oh, gosh, we better go away from it and see what happens. And uh, we ended up on this very remote island uh, in a very remote part of the very remote island with very few people around. And... Um, 
And I had no one really to talk to except for my husband, which was very wonderful, but, you know, there's a limit. And so I began to talk to the land. Um, and I began to talk to the land because in that particular place was story after story of the Kaliach, of the old woman that created and shaped the land in Gaelic mythology. So there were place names. And there were mountains that looked like a reclining figure of a woman, you know, that were named after the Kaliach. Mm. Um, and so I saw all of this and I began to see shapes in rocks myself and in landscape foundation, uh, um, uh, landscape formations. And because I had nobody else to talk to when I was walking the dogs every morning, I'd talk to the rocks and I'd talk to the Kaliach. And I really felt as if that was that was my that was a really profoundly transformative time in my relationship with the land because it's the first time that I really believed that these archetypes are actually alive in the land mm. they're imminent mm. in the land and if we pay attention we can enter into relationship with them so there was a place um, down by the shoreline which was kind of hidden and nobody ever went and there was a, a you could see the silhouette of an old woman in one of the cliff faces if you stood at the right angle and the stories do say that the Kaliak stands and looks out to sea waiting for the return of her husband Mananan Maclear and that was a difficult time for me so I used to stand next to this Kaliak sometime and sometimes mm. and she taught me all I needed to know about endurance and waiting but round the corner there was this remarkable rock formation which looked like basically it looked like a sofa um, so there were three walls of cliff and then there was something that was this, the size of, of a single bed, like, mm. a, like kind of a mattress. And I slept there every now and again when it got too light in the summer and I was desperate to see the stars. And then we moved away. And again, to cut a long story short, my husband went back when we finally sold our house on the island and um, to pick up some things that he had left there. And I said to him, oh, go back to, to that place, go back to the rocky place and, you know, just say hello for me and I had called this sofa the Kaliach's bed because it was right next door to this silhouetted Kaliach so he went back and it had gone it had vanished the 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 huge thick stone mattress which was made of Lewisian gneiss which is the second oldest and one of the hmm. hardest rocks on the planet it is as if somebody had just taken that mattress out and you know believe me it was sandwiched it was well wedged in there and it wasn't there anymore mm. and it was quite a way up from the sea you know you could conceive of the fact that maybe a storm had come in and the waves had lifted up but gosh I mean this was a huge thing and you know I know that sounds a little bit woo woo to some people it's like are you really saying that because you left you know the Kaliak's bed kind of vanished but I do believe in reciprocity in relationship with the land so you know I was all tied up with how much I had let I had um left behind me when I moved away from Lewis because I loved that land with all my heart you know I was focused on my own grieving but then I suddenly thought well gosh what if the land grieves for us when we mm, go mm, mm, because it had been a very intense relationship and I think many traditional cultures do have that sense of reciprocity you know people like Robin Wall Kimmerer talk about it all the time but I don't think we in the west are generally used to thinking about it in that way we think that we have a relationship with a crow you know, or we have a relationship with a rock. But what am I in a crow's mythology? I know what <laughs> a crow is in mine, but, you know, what does a crow That's see great. when a crow <clears throat> looks at me? What do I want a crow to see? That whole sense of just flipping um, the mirror a little bit. And, that yeah, that was a, that was a very big... That was a very big moment in my relationship with place. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it, I think it, it, we understand that in terms of uh, uh, Jung's idea of synchronicity and the, just yeah. the the bedrock belief that somehow we're mysteriously connected with the rest of the cosmos. Indeed, and and certainly as you know, he revised his concepts of archetypes accordingly later in life, and then looking at much of the post Jungian thought from people like Hillman, which picks up really on some ancient traditions, uh, such as the Sufi tradition, that that hold that archetypes are not, you know, aspects of the human psyche that they have an independent existence. So the mm -hmm. ancient Sufis would have argued that the archetypes, stories, synchronicities emerge from what has been termed the mundus imaginalis, the, the imaginal world which occupies a place between the physical world and the world of the intellect, mm -hmm. um, that they live there. And if we are, and, and that is a very similar concept to the old British and Celtic notions of the other world. Mm -hmm. The other world in our traditions is not the land of the dead. It is a place where archetypal 
animals live, where archetypal deities live. It is a place that you can slip into if you either very lucky or unlucky, depending on the, the shape of what follows. And <laughs> that sense that it is entangled, the other world is entangled with this world in our tradition. You know, it's not a different place. It's just like slipping through a veil. And that's very much like this ancient Sufi idea of the mundus imaginalis. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I do tend to think of of the physical world overlaid with this, arc, you know, this other world full of archetypes. And if we are receptive and if we are in profound enough relationship, we, we, we can see it that way. That, that to me is what I call the mythic imagination. Mm. It's kind of an overlay mm -hmm. on the physical. Mm -hmm. So that the physical is really important. It's important to know what a crow is. It's important to know the habitat, what, what it eats, you know, its behavior. But also a crow is something mythical. You know, a crow is the Morrigan goddess in Irish, very profound and powerful goddess in Irish mythology. But it can only be that if you know what a crow is, if you've accepted the physical. So it's that entanglement mm -hmm. that really, I think, is at the heart of our ancestral perspective on all of this and seems very much to make sense to me today from my own experience. As Jung's understanding of the archetypes continued to grow and his eventual encounters with them during his uh, creative illness, they say. There was both the fascination with these archetypal figures, but also the danger of them. Yeah. Because human beings are of a different order, that the human archetype has its own archetypal underpinning, mm -hmm. but the archetype of the crow, the archetype of Baba Yaga, the archetype of Poseidon, these are all, in some sense, smaller versions than the human potential, but by that virtue, infinitely more powerful in the limitation of the archetype. So, as you approach the archetype of the hag to learn, to be a, an apprentice, so to speak, how does a woman honor what the hag teaches her and also avoid being possessed by her in a way that the archetype limits her or captures her in something that might ultimately be less than human or different than human? Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting question that I will admit I have not thought about. Um, thinking about it on my feet, um, I, I see all of these archetypes as, as simply in a way as different faces, um, as, 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 as kind of reflecting facets of us back at ourselves, but never reflecting the whole. Um, because I think you're absolutely right. I don't think it's possible or desirable for a human to become Kaliuk because that is one archetypal way of being in the world. Right. And in order to be human, you've got to have all of the other stuff that's added in, mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the multiplicity. Um, and I think it's important. And I do talk to a lot of, a lot of women about this, particularly who, who have a kind of spirituality that is associated with particular female deities, you know, in, in, in our particular traditions, that that is not all there is to be. And to choose one particular facet over all of the others can be indeed very, very limiting. So I think, and, and yet there is a transformative power that makes you want to submit yourself to that archetype. But, but for me, yes. it's been different archetypes at different times of my life. Uh, you know, you, you, you embroil yourself in one and then you let it go because you've, I want to say, outgrown it, but I don't mm. mean that in a kind of, you know, uh, I'm older than you kind of way. I just mean it's time to move on to express yeah. a different facet of your being. So, no, that is a, that is a very important point. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, yeah, it's an interesting one. I, I think that uh, for Jung, as he really understood the power of these forces, he was most concerned that their representations had fallen out of a culture. That if we stop talking about the goddesses, if we start talking about the life of trees and the life of the ocean, it doesn't mean that that life doesn't exist. It just means it's invisible to us and is still acting and in some ways acting in ways that interfere 
with the individual development because we don't have a right relationship to them, which is often reverential and yeah. respectful because we understand how powerful these forces are. And we might seek their boons, we may seek to learn from them, but we also know where they belong rather than rummaging around in our organs making us unwell or rummaging around in the collective unconscious sp springing up as bizarre political ideologies and strange charismatic leaders yes i mean i you know i i think in a sense um you you give power to what you believe in um mm -hmm. in the sense that you know the archetypes i suspect reflect us back just as you know uh, reflect we reflect them back at themselves mm, just yeah. as they reflect us back at ourselves because if you accept mm. this notion of archetypes having an independent existence in whatever place you might then they too have their own journey of becoming they're growing yeah. they're transforming they're changing and i think one of the pities about contemporary culture when it looks back at old stories and old archetypes is that it sees them as static yes you know we see this all the time in in, in certain pagan traditions at least in this part of the world where you know they might say for example honor the goddess the old irish goddess bridget well apart from the fact that we don't actually know very much about her she would have been that 2000 years ago in a very different culture in a very different times and as we've grown 2000 years older lost some knowledge <laughs> that's very valuable gained other knowledge that's very valuable as the culture has transformed as the things that that uh, kind of um beset us are, are changing then we need to anticipate the possibility that an archetype might change so i think a lot of the the kind of negative power of an archetype is this idea that that we don't really understand them and we want to capture them and define them and confine them and we won't let them grow and i think that's when a relationship <coughs> becomes toxic just as it would you know between two humans um where you have one you know you see you see somebody as they were 20 years ago mothers do it all the time you know i'm constantly hearing it from my friends you know i know you no you don't you knew me when i was 18 <laughs> then i left home and i've become lots of different things yeah, you know yeah. it's a yes. it's kind of i don't want to trivialize it but but to me it's that and i think that is certainly one of the great dangers in in, um, in archetypes so you know in putting these archetypes out there in Hagitude uh, I am by no means suggesting that we can find them and define them you know we need to bring them right up to date what is the trickster archetype now what does that look like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so in the book I tried to give some you know contemporary examples as well because we can't be those people anymore we've, mm -hmm. we've changed when you were talking about the evolution of the archetype I was remembering the first time early in the training where I was really discovering von Franz's work on fairy tales and the way she was presenting fairy tales as artifacts of events that had happened in the collective unconscious that archetypes were fighting and breeding and some dying and that the implications of the collective unconscious reshaping itself as the archetypes continued to have their independent life was so extraordinary yeah. uh, and so stunning mm -hmm. just remarkable and the challenge i think of holding the fairy tales for instance as these um, observations of the archetypal world and then trying to find a way to personalize them having a foot in both worlds mm. what a challenge that can be to hold that middle space mm. indeed and i want to say that's one of the things i just loved about hagitude is that you you tell the old stories but uh you know the writing is so lively and fresh and personal and there's so much of you in there and people that you know and have worked with that it really comes to life not as a an ancient artifact but it's something that is alive in your life, alive, alive in the lives of other women that you know. And so you can really feel that juicy process of, of change and transformation in those archetypes in your writing, Sharon. Oh, well, that's lovely. Thank, thank you so much. I, you know, I think I, in some ways, these archetypes have vanished from human consciousness. You know, mm -hmm. we, we've, we've right. lo or at least we've lost track of them. Um, yeah. And it's t it's time 
that we brought them back again. And yeah, I am very much a, a fan of what Jung said about cultural mythology, about you know when the, what he said about the cultural myth failing us, and when the cultural myth fails us, the, the myth making we fall out of myth in a sense. That was a, another mm-hmm. Jungian D. Stevenson Bond, I think, who coined that particular phrase. But we fall out of myth. But then Jung said the the myth making capacity belongs with the individual and to me it belongs with the the individual finding a relationship with those old archetypes whose time has come again and bringing them back into consciousness so that we we kind of restore the lost connection with them and and for older women who who do not have any place in this culture uh, mm. There is no story for us in this culture that is positive. The story is one of decline um, and managed decline, you know, so that we are managed to stay out of the way and to be silent and not to bother people. Um, that's the only story we have here. So we absolutely have to bring new stories or, in fact, old stories, um, old stories transformed back mm. into consciousness today. Otherwise, all of this life that we have post-menopause will be for nothing. Mm. Um so I think you know stories. Stories, as you well know, uh, and as I knew when during my um, the years when I finally left corporate life and I practiced as a psychologist for a good many years and focused very much on narrative therapy. Mm-hmm. Stories capture the imagination and help people to see ways out of an impossible situation or um, different roles to play in an impossible situation, mm-hmm. and they have that power in our. You know, not just for people who are dealing uh, with mental health crises or with other profound problems in their lives, but just on a day to day basis as we as we try to figure out who we can best be mm-hmm. in this world. Your uh, comment uh, reminds me so much of uh, a favorite quote by uh, G.K. Chesterton um, that always tickles me in the back of my mind. Uh, Fairy tales do not tell children that dragons exist. Children already know that dragons exist. Mm -hmm. Fairy tales tell children that dragons can be killed. Yeah, Mm -hmm. beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I I really do think that there is very little that you can't learn from a fairy tale, you know? Mm -hmm. I really think that uh, um, bringing bringing story back into the world in in a way, um, in the way that it used to be held is really important to me. So not just in books, but stories being told again, you know, trying mm-hmm. to bring. And, and so the next book that I'm working on uh, is a collection of the stories that are in Hagitude and more. We've done a, oh. a, a, with a colleague, I've done a really big delve into European folklore and mythology and have quite a big collection of wow. different old women characters. And, you know, what we really want to do more than anything, as well as collecting them to, into a book that people can read, is have people tell them again, you know, mm-hmm. tell them to their kids, tell them to each other, talk about them. When I lived in Ireland, that was kind of what you did. You know, if somebody came for a cup of tea or for a meal in the evening or whatever, it was kind of almost like the price of your dinner that you, you told a story or you sang a song or you read a poem or, or, or something. Um, that kind of Cayley yeah, culture that, that still goes on in certainly in the, in the Irish-speaking parts of the country. And just to have those stories able to to trip off our tongues again Mm -hmm. because the more they're told the more real they become and the more real that way of being in the world becomes and the more you activate the archetype Mm -hmm. the collective unconscious Mm, that's beautiful well i'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about the hagitude like who who's it for or maybe what are you hearing about it who's responding to it what are they saying um well, it it was precisely for women who don't know what to be now mm. that they have lost all of the things that defined them. Mm. And given that our culture does seem still to value women for fertility and attractiveness to whoever you want to be attractive to, mm-hmm. when that begins to go, we have no other role. And so what I was trying to do was to inspire older women in these quite long years of the second half of our lives to find something to be that is that is meaningful that is authentic and so you know in Hagitude I talked um, very much about what I called the inner hag so this idea that each of us has an inner hag which reflects our calling which reflects the essence of who we are and will be different from woman to woman so one woman might 
find that her inner hag is a trickster or a truth teller character another woman might find that her inner hag is the fairy godmother or a kind of mm -hmm. mentoring kind of character another might find that her inner hag is um, to channel the furies who were the face of righteous wrath in, in the Greek tradition so so really it was aimed at all women who are just looking for something to be and mm -hmm. something to care about in the second half of their lives what's curious about it which I didn't well, I say I didn't expect it, but I'm not entirely sure, is that it's also appealing to, to several younger women as well. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that is so important because it's all very well for women who've got to 50 or whatever to say, OK, who am I, who am I now? But in the world today, 20-year-olds don't even know who to be, you know, in the yeah. next 10 years, let alone by the time they get to 80. And I think really in a world that is so beset by by such awful challenges where people are just wondering what life is for whether the planet will still be able to mm -hmm. accommodate it by the time they get to 80 that sense that there is something worth living for you know beyond the next 20 years or whatever that there is something still to be there is something to do there is something to give i think is really important for young people otherwise you know they just run the risk of falling into a, an endless pit of despair and nihilism and uh, that's not that's not what we need and and one of the things that um i think we've touched on just a little bit so far today but it's certainly in your book too and something that i'm very aware of is the way that the culture there's something about the way that old women are thought of and treated that uh, makes it very difficult for young women to have relationships with older women. And I run uh, women's fairy tale retreats, actually. And one of the things that's been so, so powerful is to see the uh, generations meet. Generations, women from different generations meet and mentor and enjoy each other and learn from each other. At my last retreat, um, we sat around the room according to age, and I think the youngest person there was uh, 21, and the oldest person there, the oldest woman, was 71. So there was this 50-year age span among the participants. It was very moving, and uh, I, you know, so I, so I, I think you're right. I think you know the the way that um, our our cultures uh, kind of bias against age means that women are often seen as um, invisible, as you talk about in the book, as they get older, and especially invisible to younger women who probably don't want to think that they're going to wind up looking like us one day. Um, but it really robs younger women of a resource when they can't be in connection with older women. Yes, and, and of course, until very recently, there would have been those connections within families as well as within communities, but mm -hmm. in a fragmented world where you know families are fragmented and nobody stays in the same place anymore. Yeah. Um, those, those, uh, that ability to bring the generations together hardly exists. You know, I can't think of very many situations here in, in, in my world where that would happen spontaneously mm -hmm. if you didn't have a family you know, with 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 lots of um, with, with lots of generations available to you, but it, but also it is the the problem in the way that older people have become what the culture is trying to make them into. Very often, mm. you know, we do yeah. see that we see many older people just kind of losing losing the will to transform still oh, that's uh, losing the will to be engaged because the culture has told them they must retire for heaven's sake you know mm -hmm. retire from what i mean i don't you know i know it means retiring from a job and a profession but but it seems to mean more than that that you just kind of like almost check out and i see yeah. that a lot in, in in older people i see also a whole bunch of very wise older people who would have a lot to offer if there were opportunities for them to do so so partly it is because we have become what the culture is trying to make us into and that's what we really really need we need to set a fire a light in you know the hearts of, of older women to to just think that now oh, this could be great mm -hmm. and nobody is going to do it for us you know the story mm -hmm. changes with us one one person at a time one in a hag <laughs> at a time and it can be so inspiring so i think we you know a lot of the women that so i have had a year-long um program built around hagatude a kind of course which is just coming to an end and 
We've had over a thousand people enrolled in it, and a lot of those women are really seriously looking at ways now of going back out into their community and finding ways to change things, to bring mm. people together. And, you know, that's all that you, to me, that's all that you could ever do. You sow the seeds of change and transformation. You you tell the stories that capture people's imagination and th then it's they're off, you know. That's, mm -hmm. that's kind of what you need. So more and more of these stories, um, I think, are really, <laughs> really important. That's, that's great. So leaning a little bit more into what obstructs women from rediscovering that more ancient wellspring, because it's archetypal, in a sense it is in the ground of each woman, of each person, one obstruction is that the culture, in a sense, hypnotizes women to forget or to lose track of this other world, their dreams, the way that one can listen to nature. What are some of the other transformations that an older woman may need to go through before they can lay claim or acknowledge even that there is other worlds, that the archetypal realms are true, that the thin places exist? Well, I'd, I'd say there are two things that are, that are profoundly important. One is um, aligning oneself more deeply with an embodied existence. You know, um, when we get older, the body begins to fail and a lot of people and, it, and, you know, bits start to fail and it's not quite so pretty to look at. And therefore, a lot of women, as they get older, seem to to move away from that sense of being an embodied physical person, because it's just like, you know, they don't want to look at this. And I think what I've seen an interesting phenomenon, um, actually, bizarrely on social media over the past few years where people are putting up images of very wrinkled old women with bright shining eyes yes. and even younger women are saying that's beautiful mm. and I think it's I think that sense of you know so I had a, um, a life-threatening illness a couple of years ago I was diagnosed with lymphoma and uh, it was in the middle or at the beginning actually of the pandemic and lockdown and if and it took a long while for it to be diagnosed and if it hadn't been diagnosed then i would have been dead within four oh, months God. it was very aggressive God. very treatable happily because of the aggressiveness mm -hmm. but that sense of all of a sudden looking at my body and thinking oh my god all of the things that you have got me through you know all of the things i mean the body is literally a soulmate you know mm. it's not a backdrop it is a soulmate and we are yeah, our bodies and that whole sad. sense of that was something that i didn't have until i grew older and it began slowly to fail and then you realize how important it is so i would say that is a hugely important thing that sense of that that looking at the body being with the body accepting the fact that it's going to go into decline which leads me to the second point which is to have conversations about death mm. because that brush with death or what i talked about in haggitude is that walk through the valley of the shadow of death because i didn't i wasn't led there in the end um changed everything for me and enabled me to really befriend death and that sounds perhaps a little bit weird, but you know, in, in the work that I do, working with stories, I kind of, I kind of archetypalize, if that's a verb, everything. Um, so I personify everything. Mm -hmm. So if I think about death and befriending death, death becomes an old woman um, who happens to be a character in one of the stories I tell in Haggitude, and, and death has to be somebody that I can imagine having a relationship with. And that ability to accept really genuinely that we, us, not our mother or our partner or anybody or a friend or a family member who might have died, because that's very raw and very real, but it's not as real as when you know that you yeah, yeah. <laughs> personally sure. are at death death's door um, that really that I think it, we cannot live fully and I'm far from the first person to express this idea if we do not have the ability to walk hand in hand with death mm -hmm. knowing that one of these days she's going to say okay over here now mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we can't that's a it's a little bit like menopause it's a little bit like old age it's another one of those conversations that our culture deals with very badly yeah 
Yeah. Whereas in other traditional cultures, you know, it is, of course, it's part of life. So I think that those two things, which are clearly uh, are related, that real sense of embodied existence and the fact that that embodied existence is going to end mm. um, and living every day in the knowledge of that makes does make every day more alive. There's no question about it. Yeah, I mean, this is something I love to talk about on the podcast, just as a whole episode, but I, I've worked with a few people who have sort of persistent death anxiety that really interferes with lots of things. And the antidote always is to lean into that. Mm. And just, yeah, I'm going to die. Yeah. And then the kind of crippling anxiety resolves and the person feels more alive. Yes, but you know, I think I think that a lot of our focus, um, that a lot of the cultural mythology that we are living by and that is crippling both us and the planet comes out of that fear of death. Mm. You know, you can't ever grow older in a in a meaningful way if you're frightened of the end of the journey. Yeah. You know, you we have this kind of cultural eternal youth syndrome going on where we are just not looking at it. We don't want to look at it. We don't want to see it as a culture. And so we're constantly focused on more, 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 because we think that's all there is to grow into. Uh, we're constantly focused on the individual because keeping ourselves alive at all costs is, 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 you know, is what preoccupies us. And I think once you have really genuinely faced the reality of death as, yeah, another transformation in certainly in my belief system as opposed to an absolute end um, then ever then all of that shifts mm -hmm. you begin to want different things you begin to your values shift a little bit um, you certainly don't do things that you don't want to do if you know if there's a way of I mean clearly we all have to end a living but if there's a way of cutting out that stuff it it's yeah it is profoundly transformative and death is the ultimate transformation and certainly again in our native cultures from where many of these stories spring um death it was life was a spiral you know mm -hmm. um it wasn't a linear hero's journey mm -hmm. it was a spiraling mm -hmm. kind of post heroic heroine's journey mm -hmm. death rebirth death rebirth on yep. it went yeah. there was no sense of an ending When I worked as a medical social worker before I was uh, an analyst, uh, I worked in a level four burn trauma unit. So we treated the cases that were flown in from other hospitals, very severe cases. So it introduced me in a very acute way to death, especially shocking death, an unexpected death. And then as I continued my analytic work and broadened my understanding in a number of ways, I continued to reflect on how my analysis and how I myself was still trying to hold this spectrum of experiences. And I came to see how afraid we all are of decrepitude, which is its own category, and in many ways less afraid of death. Having seen numerous people come to the end of an agonizing process and to pray to be released, to, to pray to the death mother to just gather mm. them in her arms and take them from this racked body how important that is, uh, seeing my own mother come to that place. There is such a, a grace, such a relief. But facing decrepitude, mm. that's more complicated, and I think so much of our resistance is trying to fight that declining quality of life and many people will often say, I'd love to just be really, really vital and then just one day don't wake up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Just bypass all the decrepitude and then just somebody flips the switch and yeah. we're, you know, we're free out into the cosmos. Yeah. But facing that loss of capacity, 
Mm-hmm. Well, Whether and pain it's physical, and mental, too. and pain and suffering, yeah. absolutely. Dig- the loss of dignity. Yeah. You know, I'm Indeed. 61, and I'm at this point where if I sleep too long, my body hurts from just laying down <laughs> so long. <laughs> I, just, I was 14, I was like, I could sleep for 18 hours if you'd let me. And now <laughs> my body is like yelling at me, scolding me mm-hmm. to get out of bed because it's miserable <laughs> from not moving after, mm-hmm. you know, seven hours or six hours. Mm-hmm. Uh, so all of these <laughs> signals um, of change and accommodation. Indeed. And I guess really, you know, how you approach that, and it's easy to say, well, it isn't easy to say because, you know, we've all, I'm sure, had our periods of um, painful um, disorders and illnesses, whether we're old or not, so we kind of perhaps know what it looks like or what it feels like. But it depends very much on what you think this existence is for, doesn't it? And so I do say, you know, I do subscribe to the old platonic perspective on the world, um, strange as perhaps that seems, seems that, you know, we choose to come into a physical form with mm-hmm. all of the, that implies, you know, Plato and um, and certainly Plotinus would have had the concept that we don't only do that, we choose to come to a particular place at a particular time to be born to particular parents because we have something to learn and something to offer, you know, mm-hmm. the two aspects of calling, something for us, for our soul's journey, something to give to the world. And it's just part of physical existence. And, and, you know, I do not think, I mean, for sure, none of us really want to embrace it, but that's the journey, isn't it? That is the journey. Um, You get the good stuff and you get the bad stuff. And I think you have to go through those phases if you are going to get the most out of this physical incarnation, tough as it sounds. Mm -hmm. That's a conversation stopper. (laughs) <laughs> it's it's uh, no, it's, it's a Kairos it's, moment, you know. Right. There's so much in it. Yeah. As I was reading your book, I was also deeply moved to remember the many wise women that have protected me, guided me, helped me across my life since I was about nine years old. Mm. I became a paper boy in the neighborhood. Um, and the the determination that I had to befriend every mother in the neighborhood, mm-hmm. um, and how strange that was to them. <laughs> um, of course, I was looking for something that I couldn't have at home. But how wise, um, how welcoming, how delicately the women in the neighborhood saw me and helped in subtle ways to kind of keep me going. And then later in life, and as an adult man, having women in their 90s, wise women in their 90s, and in other realms, who were able to listen with such ruthlessness And, and give just the right piece of wisdom, just at the right time, with no sense of violence, or no sense of anger, just understanding that if I could see something just a little differently, that a whole piece would dissolve and have an opportunity to recoagulate, to reform. And the art of that, the art of that unsentimental listening Mm. and the offering of the tiny new piece that has always been something that I I just have such enormous respect for and awe. Yeah, And, and I think, you know, the point there that I pick out of that is their ability to see the pattern Mm. and to know what piece needs to shift and, you know, look at the fates in Greek mythology. They were old women, except for the male artists who liked to paint them as beautiful young women in all the texts. They were (laughs) old women because it is only old women that could see that picture and that was their job. They were weaving that tapestry which held the world in balance um, and they knew 
that if this piece fell out of place, the whole cosmos would be out of balance mm. and they knew how to put it back again. That was always the job of old women. You know, the Norns in, in Scandinavian mythology have some similar kind of function. And, and that is interesting, isn't it? That, uh, that, that even in... And, and of course, those stories of, of the fates were pre... arguably pre-patriarchy. We have to believe that mm. such a thing mm-hmm. existed. It was certainly pre-Olympian, um, mm-hmm. pre the Olympian deities who were profoundly patriarchal. The fates were much older than them and many other examples of, of older women such as the Furies um, in Greek mythology were very much older than the kind of Olympian system so yes that ability to see the picture F- fairy tales too are full of old women who spin and mm-hmm. weave mm-hmm. Um, and, and who are, are like you're both saying kind of can see, see I, I want to say with a sort of spirit of generosity that it's not about what serves them but it's it's uh, being able to to see the whole picture, Joseph, in your case, these these women who guided you, um, n- not not pursuing their own agenda, but just uh, taking in the whole picture and offering you the needed piece. So there's see, uh, yeah. it's a kind of um, almost kind of cosmological perspective. Indeed, and I think if you if you do have the opportunity to actually listen to older people, that's pretty much all they want to do, particularly as they approach the end of their lives, is to just offer to anybody who will listen, really, that wisdom and that perspective which they have gained in whatever in whatever ways, large or small, through the course of their lives. There is a really strong urge in most of the older people that I have uh, spoken to or worked with you know, coming with any belief system from any class um, to just leave something behind to, to, to want to pass it on. And uh, we have to find ways of allowing older people to do that. There are a number of projects mm-hmm. that I've come across, both in the States and in, in this part of the world, which are kind of collecting, you know, that wisdom, allowing old people to tell their stories, um, recording it, if you like. And of course, that's where a lot of the folk tales mm-hmm. that we now True. know came from, you know, from folk law collectors, um, particularly in Ireland and Britain, bicycling around the country with tape recorders, um, collecting not just stories, but but bits of kind of folk wisdom that that are associated with them. Mm. Sharon, I wanted to to introduce a new uh, topic for us to talk a bit about. Um, In uh, the first third or half of your book, that you're very honest and disclosing about the role of rage and anger in deconstructing your assumptions, deconstructing your relationship to certain professions, and deconstructing your relationship to certain people. So perhaps we could talk a little bit about that arc of feminine rage, its purpose, and when when does it soften to allow other aspects of the personality to emerge? Well, I think that presupposes that rage is constant, and um, I don't know that it is, or at least I do know that for most of us it is well suppressed. Um, certainly, you know, like so many women, I grew up in an environment where I was not allowed to be angry. I certainly wasn't allowed to be angry because if I was angry, I was like my father who was very violent. So that was a kind of, you know, that's how it worked for me. And also, apart from kind of individual circumstances which suppress anger, I think the culture as a whole clearly does not find women's rage pretty. And if it doesn't find women pretty, it doesn't much like women. So we, from all angles, really, we have had this ability to express anger Um, helpfully and um, in a functional way we've had that suppressed and I think unfortunately by the time we get to menopause we still most of us have not learned how to do that have not been you know have not been allowed to do that and so you get to this stage in your life where everything seems to be falling apart your body is falling apart your mind is falling apart you know your relationships might be falling apart and the, we have that dissolution that we spoke about when we were talking about the alchemy of menopause and it just all comes pouring out it's just like the the boundaries 
are broken down, the barriers to expression of that anger are lost. And, and, and unfortunately, very often, it doesn't then come out in healthy ways because we haven't learned to express it in a healthy way. And I, again, I think, you know, that's why I, I do spend a bit of time in the book talking about the archetype of, of the Furious, because they weren't angry for the sake of being angry. They they were angry at things that needed to be mm -hmm. somebody to be angry about and that needed mm -hmm. putting back into balance. And you could only put the world back into balance if you had expressed, you know, what was wrong with it fully. And I think once women have got through menopause, if they have learned that this anger can be transformed into something useful then they do very well mm. but if they haven't learned that during menopause then you get a lot of very angry older women who yeah. just don't even know why they're angry because they haven't had anybody to you know to to, to explain to them what's happening in their bodies i mean we still you know most women still know so little about what what happens to their bodies in menopause yeah. what happens to their minds in menopause so I think I think it's a really very much depends on the individual, but I suspect that for pretty much all of us, um, we have a very strong suppression of anger in the early part of our lives. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking before uh, when when you, you know, at some point before in our discussion, talking about uh, you know the truth teller and the way that anger helps us become the truth teller, or it can. I mean, it can also distort things, but it can it can break through the kind of compulsion to be nice or mm -hmm. that compulsion to be kind. Yeah. You know, there's there's a, a lot of stuff out there in the culture telling, particularly girls, be kind mm -hmm. and and you know suppress suppress that rage. Uh, but when we when it comes up and we can lean into it, then it it kind of melts away that false veneer and we can know our own truth. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I, I think it's so profoundly important. And I, I do think that once, certainly for me, um, once I got through the raging years <laughs> of menopause, and I have to say, you know, for all my training, I did not really even recognize it at the time. You know, hindsight really is a very yeah. wonderful thing. <laughs> um, but then, once you've recognized that and once you realize when we have passed through menopause, if we learn to to um, to kind of harness that anger for useful things, what I find and what a number of my friends of the same age find is that it allows you to become outspoken in ways that really are helpful so that you will not let people talk down to you, mm -hmm. for example, you know, that you are able then to to express that to I want to say put them in their place but that sounds unpleasant I don't necessarily mean that without being an idiot yeah. you know just in a way that is firm that is confident that comes from a sense of who you are and that is that is the best um, consequence I think of harnessing and mm, transforming, alchemizing menopausal rage. Mm -hmm. It just mm -hmm. turns us into people that will not be doormats anymore. And well, that's it's, a really good thing. It's kind of a claiming of authority. Yes, that's yeah. a lovely, that's a much more mm -hmm. a better way of putting it, yeah. Well, I think I think what I'm hearing, it, which is so important, that when we're in a state of distress, one way to cope with that is simply to discharge it so that we can stay grounded enough to take care of whatever our responsibilities are. And there's innumerable ways that people will discharge anger or discharge any number of things, anxiety. Mm. And that can become atmospheric. It can be displaced in all kinds of ways where people feel confused that they're the recipient of it. But as you said, with introspection, when the anger becomes focused, when there's a more surgical clarity about you know what is the place that's irritating, what is the place that's um, chaining me up, locking me up, and to be able to, like a magnifying glass, really put it where it's going to make a difference for that individual, then it becomes such an incredible tool of transformation. Mm -hmm. I can understand that. 
Yeah, there's a wonderful book, and I can't remember which one it is now, but I talk about it in Hagitude. I think an American uh, writer talking about all of the ways in which women's anger has fueled really important change mm. in culture, you know, from the Me Too movement to Black Lives Matter, um, you know, just all kinds of different focusings in of, of that, um, what otherwise would probably be undifferentiated rage into, into changing something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it brings up that distinction between aggression and self-assertion. Indeed. That aggression has its aim to do harm. Mm -hmm. And self-assertion, I think, in the highest expression, has to do with improving the context, improving the system that one is sitting in or subject to or observing so that it actually functions better, functions more thoughtfully, does less harm, provides more good for the greatest number of people. And the energy that it takes to shift a system can sometimes be enormous because many of the bureaucracies we live in are these monolithic structures that require an enormous amount of applied heat Mm. to move the gear even a little bit so that it's more humane, more balanced, more fair. Indeed, and, and also looking at ways of expressing it. I mean, uh, again, I write about this in Hagitude, but one of the, the most wonderful groups I came across when I was researching the book, I never heard of, of them before, was the Raging Grannies, hmm. you know, the, who began in, in um, Canada, um, I think, on nuclear, protesting against nuclear submarines, uh, if, if I remember it rightly. But they used humour and satire and ridicule hmm. Um, to to create change, you know. So what what made them furious? They managed to transform that overtly, and you know, into street performances where you know they would wear ridiculous clothes, and uh, they would they would literally perform in the middle of streets to make their point. And that, to me, was absolutely perfect example of the ability to kind of transmute to transmute that energy so that you know you still have a strong emotion there. You've got the satire, and you've got the ridicule. You haven't put a lid on it but you've just allowed it to show a different face. Well, it's a wonderful example of trickster energy. Yes, Yes, and that. Yes, Yes, indeed. How wonderful. Sharon, before we finish up, uh, I'd like to just ask, is there anything that you haven't been asked in any of your interviews that you wish somebody had asked so you could bring something forward? Gosh. That's the kind of question that always puts you on the spot. And you know, know. if you had 10 minutes to go away and think about it, you could think of something. But yeah, so I trusting your think. intuition, you know. I don't think so. I can't think of anything. Um, no, I think I've, I've probably done quite, I've talked quite a lot over the past couple of years. I've probably exhausted all possible <laughs> options. Is the truth of it, Joseph? Oh. Thank you for asking. Yes. Well, we've so enjoyed this chance to have this conversation. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just left with the sense that there's a lot more for us to talk about. But uh, I love the intersection, Sharon, of uh, Jung and your particular work and the way you work with mythology. And it's just... It's just very, very rich to be in conversation. So thank you so much for coming. Ditto. I really appreciated your perspectives on it as well. I'm going away with lots of food for thought. So thank you so much. So let's transition into working with the dream. And before we jump into that, I'd like to remind our listeners that we have an online learning platform that we've designed with you in mind, that we've created a 12-month program, a module each month, that introduces you to the various lenses that we use as we scan a dream for meaning. This is based on Jung's incredible insight and his vast amount of experience working with people's dreams in order to decipher and integrate the deep medicine and guidance that we receive each night. So 
We hope that you'll go over to our website, thisjunginlife.com, click on Dream School, take a look, and then ask the dream maker in you, is this a path? Yeah, it will. And uh, let's look at someone who submitted a dream um, because perhaps she found that was a path for her. Today's dreamer is a 63-year-old woman who has for the last year been traveling around Europe volunteering on organic farms and helping friends with home projects. So while she's doing that, she's also working on a series of poems about her travels, and she imagines that she'll be doing uh, this nomadic life for for quite a while. And I um, I just want to say, I just love that. I mean, isn't that just exactly what Sharon was just talking about, about sort of transformation and new life and, you know, uh, n- new discoveries in our hagdom? So here's, here's the dream. The dreamer titled the dream, Losing the Girl. I found myself in a cavernous room, a baby fostering an adoption facility, with babies waiting like young chicks contained into very large plastic containers. The sides weren't high so they could see out and could have gotten out, but they were packed in tight and seemed content to sit and wait. I looked over the babies to select one. I wanted to avoid the crying baby stage, so I asked the caretaker, a middle-aged woman used to the tough work of looking after all these babies, which was their oldest baby. She extracted a girl out of the center of the first container, telling me that they'd had this one for a long time. So I took this girl, who was not a baby, but closer to a teenager, on a fostering basis. Next scene. We had gone from the facility into the city and shopped at a takeaway so I could buy her meal, some sort of relatively healthy salad, though the takeaway did not look like a healthy choice. It was just what was available. While I was paying at the counter, I assumed the girl was waiting behind me. I didn't understand the currency, so I offered money to the guy behind the counter to choose from. He took some of it and then gave me back a load of coins from various different currencies that I again didn't know the value of. I decided just to accept this exchange because I didn't know how to sort what I had been given. However, when I turned around with the salad, the girl was gone. I became frantic as I tried to find her. I had agreed to fostering with a caretaker woman, so I was supposed to return the girl to the facility. In my desperation to find the girl, I began crying out into the crowded mall, help me, help me. I rushed into a business which looked like a drop-off daycare explained the situation to a woman staff member asking her to help me find the girl. She seemed like she might be able to help, but really she had her own domain, the daycare she was in charge of. And what I was beginning to realize even more so after I woke up was that the girl had slipped away by her own choice. I wasn't scared she had been abducted. No, just panicked that she had wandered away from me in an independent move with no discussion. This left me feeling like a bumbling idiot, quite rattled, because it reflected badly on my ability to take care of someone in my charge, and wondering why I had taken this work on in the first place. So she notes, I was and remain a very devoted mother. My children are fully grown now, so last year I sold my home and have been doing volunteer farm work in Europe for the past year, while also working on a series of poems. All have all of which has been very rich, a very rich experience, which I have enjoyed. I have just signed up for dream school after a series of dreams that I need to get back to school, followed by this intense dream that I want to fully understand. And she says the main feelings were wanting to avoid choosing an infantile demanding baby, then confused by the foreign currency and distraught that I lost the girl in my care. And she notes a few associations, babies and children. I very much associate with the creative, nurturing mother archetype. Money, my general sense about money is that I have my own currencies exchange on what I value. I like living simply and volunteering, so minimal monetary exchanges. Loss, or is it loss of control? I'm a pretty organized and capable person. Who doesn't lose things? But this dream girl isn't a thing. She had two legs to walk away.
Oh, this is a kind of a meaty dream, I think. It, yes. <laughs> it, it's, it is very meaty. And, and part of what I'm responding to is that so many of the images are beautifully defined and have so much feeling valence in them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So much happens, uh, I, I guess I'm drawn to just start in the beginning with the setting and yes, just riff. Yes, me too. And how, how, do, how do we hold that? So she's in a cavernous room, a facility that both fosters and adopts out babies, which uh, I guess is presented in a way that's almost commercialized. You know, they're in mm -hmm. plastic containers, much like young chicks, packed tight, sitting and waiting. So one of the things, I mean, I think I'm kind of with you, it's like, where to start? Let's start right there. And one of the things that strikes me about this dream is that the end, kind of the very last sentence of the dream sort of picks up right back at the beginning, which is like, what is she doing there? Why? Like, sometimes it's really interesting to be curious about a dream prequel. Mm -hmm. How did she wind up in this cavernous place where she's looking to foster a child? And she asks herself that at the end, why am I doing this? So that's, a, that's something that, um, it's know, interesting. What, what? If I, if I hold that and we, we do the, you know, the, the if then piece that the dream maker has placed her in this baby facility and she's observing them and then as she's looking over the babies there's an impulse to select one so it very well may be that the dream maker is at first putting her in a context and seeing what the ego how the ego will respond to this has not intrinsically forced the ego to react in any particular way but the impulse is to select one because they're at offer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or yeah, it's like where where is that impulse coming from? That mm -hmm. you know, because it does. You're right. It feels sort of like well, I guess this is what you do. So so just to continue, sort of riffing on that point. Um, mm -hmm. That the the scene of the baby fostering facility is replicated a few scenes later with the drop-off daycare. Now those are different things, but they both have to do with kind of like temporary care of children. Mm -hmm. So there's some theme here. And, and even this idea about, well, I don't want the crying baby stage. Uh, that's, you know, okay, that's, um, if you're gonna foster a child and you don't want the crying baby stage. Well, children cry. You know, it's it's sort of like okay. So you you you, you want the the sort of the easier job. You, you're going to do this, but you're going to do it in a way that demands less of you. So there's something about the casual way she takes on the fostering. There's something about the multiple references in the dream to the kind of transient quality of the caretaking, that it's fostering, that it's drop-off daycare. And then something about how she really wants to sort of, in some ways, take the easiest job. That makes me wonder if the dream isn't commentating on a, perhaps like an ambivalent commitment to her own creative process, perhaps. I, exactly, I was, I was there with you. There's some um, dramatization of how the dream ego attaches to outer objects. How does she hold outer objects? In the occupation, she talks about you know being a traveler. She's all over Europe. She's volunteering here and there, helping friends, and that she loves this nomadic life, you know, traveling lightly. And and that's also suggests that one is 
holding the relationship to these environments and people somewhat lightly. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, well, I'm here. Ah, oh, look, there's a box of babies. I've, I've shown up in the farm. There's some things to do. I, c I can play a role. I can contribute. Mm -hmm. There's, I can do a bit of something for a while. I think also, if she were to choose a really young baby, there's a sense that it'd be unlikely that she could finish that up quickly and then move on to the next bit. Mm -hmm. So by choosing the older child, and she's not adopting, but just fostering and in the dream, just providing a meal, just a bit of mm -hmm. salad, a walk mm -hmm. around the town, and then imagining, we don't know how old the child is, that you know, if she is fledged, if she's got enough energy to kind of go off on her own, much like a bird that's fledging, that that's a sign that things are things are in the right order. So, this image of traveling lightly through the inner and the outer world, mm -hmm. and that it, and that she is holding her inner objects with that same distance, perhaps. There's also maybe a little bit of a theme about exchange. So mm -hmm. in the first scene, you know, this kind of fostering thing, it really feels, as you pointed out earlier, almost like a commodification or commercialization mm -hmm. or something. And it's like, yeah, I'll take that one, you know. And it's, um, I don't want to say it's an unsatisfying exchange, but there's something very casual about it. And then in the next scene, there's this exchange at the takeaway. Mm -hmm. And that is a kind of, it's like, well, this is the best thing they've got, but it's not very good kind of quality to it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a similarity there. And even the exchange, there's a kind of exchange with the daycare provider, uh, you know, that it's like, can you help me? Well, no, you really can't. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know, maybe that's a bit of a stretch, but it feels like there might be this kind of sequence of, these exchanges that are um, uh, maybe missing heart in some way or in some ways pro forma or something. Yes, as you were saying that, I found myself looking at the one moment of intense emotion, mm -hmm. which is when she realizes the girl has disappeared and she's crying out, help me, help me, and she's rushing, Yes, looking, looking for aid. So in a sense, that seems to be at least the emotional climax of the dream theater. So there is something about how she holds responsibility and afterwards how she resolves it. There's a, sense, there's a moment that this as a teenage child the system has expected her to be a caregiver, a caretaker. So she has a momentary alarm. She, she has an experience of being a devoted mother. So there's a feeling that, gosh, if one of your children just walked off mm -hmm. without you knowing, you, I mean, you would want to find out what was going on. And then what comes in to defend against the panic is this assumption of autonomy and power in the other. Mm. And as a mom, Lisa, I can imagine that if your teenage girl or boy suddenly disappeared in a crowd, how horrifying that would be. Sure. And I could imagine on one level you would hope that they would be autonomous enough to find a phone to know to call you to find their way. There's another part that would be deeply worried mm -hmm. about if they would be injured in one way or another. Yeah, I found myself wondering how old this she is. I think she says something like, it's almost a teenager, so I'm thinking, mm -hmm. is this kid like 11 or 12 or something like that, which is this really kind of tender, liminal time. And I also wonder what the dreamer was like at that age or what was happening in the dreamer's life, you know, 11 or 12 years ago, whatever that number might be. You know, here's, here's what I'm beginning to think now. 
is um, I'm struck by the fact that the dreamer's other re- recent dreams have been urging her to go back to school. Mm. And mm. I'm, I'm wondering if this is a dream of, that's imaging an inappropriately casual commitment to her self-growth. Mm. It could be, I mean, I can imagine doing this incredible thing, which sounds fabulous, sort of selling your house and moving around. That would be such a time of wonderful growth just the experiences and the people that you meet and the way that you would be challenged but it is kind of focused in some ways on outer world experiences and i Mm -hmm. wonder if she's being asked to attend more to to the inner world in terms of overseeing her her self-growth and she says you know a couple phrases that jumped out at me um, the, there were these currencies I didn't know the value of. Right. And I decided just to accept this exchange because I didn't know how to sort what I had been given. Right. To me, that feels like a really important sentence. And is there a way that in her peripatetic lifestyle now, she's just kind of decided to accept this exchange because she's not really sure of the value of whatever it was that she had. So, I mean, I'm just speculating here because I don't know. I think that's, you've landed on it because if we think of the the young babies lined up in these containers, they represent this enormous amount of potential. All these things that could be born Mm. inside of her, Mm -hmm. thank goodness they're alive, but there's an archetypal process that is tending them in a kind of latency that the ego needs to select some potential so that it can mature and can mature in a way that's in relationship to the ego. I think you're right on it when she says, well, I'd like to develop something in myself, but I don't want it to be too costly. I I don't want to have to put but so much energy into it. So let me choose a potential perhaps that's not that far away that wouldn't require a massive Mm -hmm. re-education process. Mm which is certainly fine, you know, but still there's something casual about it. And that when the potential slips out of her hands, it just seems okay. She's distraught, but there is a voice that says, well, maybe that's just how it is. Joseph, I really like where where you're going and and, uh, going back to the beginning and talking about all those babies, all that potential new life. And that made me think of this very important figure in the dream of the caretaker woman. Mm-hmm. Because she says, you know, she's at the end of the dream, if I recall, one of the things she's really upset about is, I'm supposed to bring this kid back. Like, oh, maybe mm-hmm. the kid can take care of herself. It's, it's almost like she's less distraught about the kid and more distraught about the fact that she has to answer to the caretaker woman. So the caretaker woman is this important image in the psyche, almost a little bit of what we were talking about with Sharon, right? Like the the kind of archetypal feminine. And it's interesting because the dreamer capitalized those terms in the dream text. So that this is a a sort of a a manifestation of the archetype who's going to hold her to account. Did you squander your potential for new life? And, you know, you took this girl, but you're not even, you know, you're trying to do okay by her, but she didn't even really feed her that well. You let her slip away. You, you, you left all these other babies on the table. You didn't understand the value of the exchange. Yeah, I think you, you've landed on it. It's a relationship to certain potentials. And I think the last sentence might be, the medicine of the dream, the subtle confrontation where the dream ego is saying to herself, this left me feeling like a bumbling idiot Mm -hmm. rattled. It reflects badly on my ability to take care of someone in my charge, but I might say my ability to take care of a talent inside myself, a capacity, a new way to grow. Uh And wondering why I had taken this work on in the first place. So I'm wondering if there's also a fear of failure, as can often happen if we, and particularly if we've had a history of being excited or being drawn 
into taking a potential on, but actually not evaluating, can I carry this to its conclusion? Do I understand how to become a writer, a painter, change careers in a number of different ways? It reminds me of a decision that I made for myself, because as a feeling type, I can get temporarily excited about something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> and so when the thousand good ideas pop up in my head, mm -hmm. now that I'm moving through my 60s, I think of them as eggs all sitting in a nest. And I have a deal with my own unconscious mind that if you don't constellate enough energy around any one of those things to take me to the conclusion, yeah, I'm not. I don't want to do it. I don't want it to be left high and dry, yeah. because the unconscious has abandoned me, or that yeah. my ego is the only thing that was ever interested in it. That's great. So, she's also questioning that: should she have really taken the baby, or did did she just get swept up in hmm. doing something? because she's in the atmosphere of the caretaker inside of herself. That's interesting. Yeah. But really, had I thought about it, this, this particular task, responsibility, it probably wasn't something that I had enough internal support around. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Well, we look forward to uh, seeing the streamer in Dream School. We do. <laughs> Welcome aboard. <laughs> You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.